Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today for a trip to the Louvre in Paris. Explore the most visited museum in the world. Discover the history of the building from the medieval castle of the early 13th century to the pyramid of the late 20th. Then we're going to examine the 10 greatest works of the Louvre from antiquity to the French romantic painter, highlighting the wonderful women of the, of the Louvre, um, including the Venus de Milo and the Mona Lisa. And so uh, this program is led by French tour guide, Patrick uh, Herpe. I'm not sure if I put the accent in the right spot. Uh, and he's gonna be Zooming live from Paris. So folks, Patrick is joining us from Paris. How cool is that? Uh, again, wanna thank the uh, Friends of the Library and the Corning Foundation for co-sponsoring. So all nearly 300 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Patrick for joining us this morning or this afternoon where he is. And uh, Patrick, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. So now you're going to have a fairly different accent because I'm, of course, I'm a born raised Parisian and uh, I'm going to speak to you with my uh, French accent. So I hope you are going to be able to understand all what I'm going to tell you. Yes, I'm from Paris. Look, I've got my, my cup from my soccer team, Paris Saint-Germain. Uh, which is my team, but we're not going to speak about soccer today. We're going to speak about art and about the Louvre. So I've seen I've seen lots of you saying hello. It was going very fast on the uh, on the chat message, but I recognize some of the names that I know already, uh, like Bonnie, Pam, Janice, or Fran. I think so. Maybe some some other were there. So sorry if I don't say hello to everybody. But uh, yes, Anne, I've seen your have seen your have seen your name passing on Bunny too. So I'm happy to 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 welcome all of you in Paris. And we're going to I'm going to close uh, the chat on my side because a part of that I can't really see my my screen. So the chat. Oh no, I just did the opposite. Instead of closing it, I just uh, make it larger. So here it is. I want, oh, I don't, yes, that's close. Perfect. So we're going to be in the Louvre uh, for one hour. It's a challenge because doing the Louvre in one hour, in fact, um, we can't do it when we walk inside. And today, virtually, we're going to be able to speak about all of the uh, artifacts and amazing uh, things uh, that you can see in the, in the Louvre on the beautiful rooms. So first, I was thinking about 10 master art artifacts and, you know, or, we have got 35,000 artifacts in the Louvre and it's hard to choose only a 10. So in fact, we're going to have 16. So that's why I say, I hope it's not going to be too long for you and that uh, we're not going to push too much over one hour, but I, I will try my best. So let's start now. And thanks a lot to Robert uh, to have um, welcomed me and uh, to give me the chance to be with you today. And this is Le Paris de Patrick, which is in fact my um, my uh, business name, if I can say. And this is also my website. And you can see on my website, on YouTube, you can see some of the virtual tour I've done. So now let's be in the Louvre. So, if that, oh, I doesn't want to go to the next one. Okay, here it is. So let's start by the history of the Louvre. And I should say that one to four about the 20 uh, masterpiece I want to speak today. And there is four rooms. I encourage you if you come to Paris not to miss in the Louvre. It doesn't mean there's only four rooms, but uh, all above all the rooms of four are absolutely amazing. And they also link to the history of the Louvre. So to start, I just met for you, not I not met, but I just pick up a little video which is explaining the uh, the Louvre history. So just have a look at that and then go inside. <laughs> So you see 800 of history. The Louvre is located by the River Seine. And if you come today to Paris, that's what you are going to see. Okay. And you see it's in, in English, so it's a good introduction in English for you. I don't know if you can hear it or if you hear me. I don't know. But first, the Louvre was a middle aged castle. We're going to speak about that. 1200 defending the entrance of the city of Paris. One and a half centuries later, then after that, the, part of the, city the king is going to live inside, that's 1380. The and then after that, we're going to arrive to the uh, Renaissance period. Uh, and that's going to change completely the vision of the Louvre. So the king Francois I, the father of Henry II, is going to start the Louvre. Henry II and his wife, Catherine de Medici, 
are going to enlarge the room. The second died, his widow, Catherine de Medici, started building and designing. And she's going to build a beautiful castle, which is the complete left side of the video. And that castle is going to disappear later on. So look at it. Then Henry the Fourth, uh, the King of France, uh, is going to enlarge the all the south part of the Louvre by the river. And you see now we have got a, a kind of large building, but we have nothing to the north side of the Louvre. Louis the Fourteenth is going to put the Louvre and also create the square square, which is at the uh, east entrance of the French Revolution, is going to become partially a museum, 1793. And then after the revolution comes Napoleon I, and he's going to do the north part of the Louvre and build also an arc for his victory. You see, this is Napoleon's work. Then after that, his nephew, Napoleon III, He's going to finish the Louvre in 1870. So precisely 1870, this is when the Louvre is totally finished. And you see how it is. But one year later, we have got a revolution when the Commune in Paris and the Commune, the revolutionary, are going to destroy the palace built by Catherine of Medici, the Tuileries Palace. So this is how you see the Louvre today, plus, of course, the pyramid, which has been built in 1989 for the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution. And that's it. So I just wanted to show you that to give you a short introduction visually. So this is the part of the video you've seen the Middle Age Castle. So when you go to the Louvre nowadays, you see that part from 1200 to 1380, but where do you see it? Well, if we were in the Middle Age, you, you will be able to see that. That was the Middle Age castle. As you can see, it's a defensive fortress based by the river to avoid the Viking and the English, which were at that time together to attack the city of Paris. We built from both sides of the river a castle, one with the loo, and in between the castle, we're putting a rope to avoid the boat of the invaders enter the heart of the city and that worked perfectly. Then after that, we changed it into a real palace in 1380. And when you visit the Louvre nowadays, that's what you can see inside. So you see the visitors of the Louvre, if you go underground by the medieval part of the Louvre, you pass in the mold. This is the mold of the Louvre. So you have to imagine that at that time it was full of water. And here you see the foundation of the Louvre. And the rest of the building goes six times upper than that. So you can see by the size of the people, how big was the palace. So that the room one, I encourage you to see it's the medieval part. The room two, I encourage you to see, it is the room of the Renaissance. So it's been from 1380, which is going to be the royal palace to the 1600s. And at that time, we're going to have got the King Henry II, which is going to build here. That's Henry IV. So Henry II is going to build the Cariatid room, which is here um, a painting of that time where you see Henry, Henry II uh, dancing with Catherine of Medici. And what is very interesting, it is a Renaissance room. So it's a ballroom. In the back of the image, you can see a balcony where the orchestra is standing. And that balcony is held by four Cariatids. These four Cariatids are completely um, a Greek uh sculpting okay and if you look at the side of the image you will see that we have got corinthian columns which are holding the roof so when you come here you see cariatid corinthian column you feel antiquity but the rest of the room is baroque so we are at the time of neo the neoclassicism which is the renaissance i really encourage you to go to see that room the third room I encourage you to see, to visit, maybe the most beautiful of all the rooms, which is done by Louis XIV in this part of the Louvre. So from 16 to 1800, this, this is to be called the absolute monarchy. And this is the gallery of Apollo. So the gallery of Apollon, the king was already nicknamed the Sun King. So he decided to build here 
uh, the place for his dancing place, for his ballroom. He didn't like so much the one from Henry II. And he liked so much that room that he used it as a blueprint for the castle of Versailles, for the mirror, uh, for the gallery of the mirror, which is the exact copy of the one that we have got in the Louvre. But in the Louvre, we don't have the mirror. We only have got the portrait, which are absolutely great. And they are all tapestry from the Gobelin. So this room have got is holding two calendars, the month calendars and the zodiacal calendars. We've got some Delacroix painting inside. And we have got, of course, everything linked to the sun. That's why um, the King Louis XIV named it Apollo, because Apollon was also the god of the sun, uh, being also uh, the god of the art. And now there's in the middle of the room, you see there's some little windows. And inside that, what do you see? Oh my God, you see the crown jewelry, the crown jewelry, which is the most expensive uh, jewelry that we've got in France, which have been belonging to the king. For instance, here on this one, you see the crown of Louis the 15th, and you see the largest diamond we've got in France, named the Regent, and that diamond is weighing 140 carats. I just said that. In case you want a Christmas present, you can take a picture of it and ask for it. It may cost a little bit. The fourth room, on the last room, I encourage you to visit in the room. It is done into the L built by uh, Louis, uh, sorry, by um, Napoleon III. So it is the apartment of Napoleon III, which are going to be done in the 19th centuries. Okay, so in the 18. Uh, 70, 1870, finished in 1870, but it's also going to go till nowadays because we're going to cover partially that. And so this is uh, the apartment. And you can see it's absolutely wonderful, absolutely tremendous. It's a little bit like the gallery of Apollo, you know, with the gold, but also have got the red velvet for all the chair. And that's amazing. We've got there 10 rooms, which are which were the place where Napoleon III was living and here is his dining room and you see here we have got we use the black wood from africa vange the name of the wood which is a very strong dark uh wood which make this room also absolutely incredible so these rooms are not very visited by the guests in the room because it's a bit difficult to find but if you come don't only stay two hours in the room like most of the people try to stay the half day and visit these four rooms, you will be amazed by the fact the Louvre is not a place for the artifact. So I carry on now, we've, speak, we've spoken about the history of the Louvre and we're going to see now five to 20, so 16 altogether, artifact not to be missed. But to introduce that, I would just want to replace the Louvre in the timeline of art. I think it's important because mainly today we have got the pleasure to have people from America or Canada. And we don't have the same timeline in Europe than you have got uh, over the Atlantic uh, because we have got a longest history. So sometimes it's a little bit difficult. So if you take the, 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 the art, that's how we divide the art, okay? The prehistoric time, the antiquity, the middle age, the Renaissance, then the modern time, impressionist cubism. And if you come to Paris, you can see all that. So the prehistorical time, like here, this is the Venus of Lespang, which it's a very, it's 20,000 years old. And that you can find in the Museum of Human Being, the Musée de l'Homme à Paris, uh, where you can see a lot of, uh, of these artifacts and also in the Museum of Saint-Germain-en-Laye, the Museum of the Prehistory of France. For the antiquity, for the Middle Age, and for the Renaissance, welcome to the Louvre, okay? That's where you are going to see all these even though there is a special museum for the Middle Age, which is named Cluny Museum. Then we arrive to the modern time. So if you want to see Impressionist, Renoir, Sisley, Degas, Van Gogh, Monet, go to Orsay Museum, where you will see all the, not only that, all the Impressionist painters. And then if you want to go to the modern art, so it's been after, the, in the 20th centuries, after 1905, you go to Pompidou Center to see the modern art. Of course, the, this last one, which is considered to be the bridge in between impressionism and modern art and the beginning of the cubism from Picasso, uh, it's not exhibited in the Louvre, it's exhibited in the MoMA in New York. So 
Like that, you've got a whole timeline and you see what we're going to speak in the Louvre, antiquity, Renaissance. I didn't choose any artifact from the Middle Age uh, because the most beautiful ones are in Cluny Museum. So let's start with all our 16 artifacts and let's start by the antiquity. I did it in a chronological order. So like that, uh, you can see um, from uh, the oldest one to the newest one in the Louvre. So the Louvre is going to start with this statue. So always I put for you um, a little map at the corner of my screen uh, for you to understand where has been found or where was located this art. So here you see we are in the Middle East. We are in between Jerusalem and Jordania. And we are exactly in Jordania, just by Amman. Uh, that's uh, the little red spot I put on my uh, on my map. And so we are going to see what is called the statue of Ain Ghazal. And the statue of Ain Ghazal is dating from 7,000 BC, meaning 9,000 years old comparing uh, to our um, to, to 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 nowadays which is the oldest artifact that we've got in um, in the Louvre and this is it so this statue why it's not such a big statue it's approximately one meter um, but when you look at it it's incredible. So the statue is has been made in the uh, Neolithic period. We think minus 7,000. We are not sure for 100 years uh, close, but around minus 7,000, the Neolithic period. And we use two materials for the statue. We, we use a plaster, plaster made from gypsum. And so we broke the plaster, uh, we broke, broke the, 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 the gypsum to make plaster. So it's like a clay, if I can say, the statue. That's for the white matters, you can see. And for the head of the statue, look at this eye contact. We use bitumen. And uh, for the eye, light, um, eye lid, sorry, and for the pupils. I really like this face, you know. I, I think the nose is so cute. And the little mouse like that. And these eyes, you can imagine, it's 9,000 eye contact you are making right now. This statue has been um, renovated, but uh, the bitumen of the eyes are totally from the origin. So 9,000 years, and now we use that for our street, for the Al-Sfati in, in the streets. And it's moving. You know that statue, we don't know uh, exactly uh, what it was made for. Uh, we guess it's a god or goddess. We are not 100% sure it's a man or a lady because we are in the prehistory. I mean, before the history, because when we start speaking about antiquity, we speak about history. And the difference between prehistory and history is the human writing. When we start writing, when we have got some human writing, we can have with for sure or nearly for sure uh, the um, the fact, but when we have just we, when we just found the statue or the artifact, we just can guess, we just can assume that the difference between prehistory and history. So now let's go to the antiquity period, which is the most important in the Louvre. So lots of antiquity, and let's start by the oldest one, the beginning. So now we are in. Egypt, you see the red spot on the map, it is just underneath Cairo. We are in a city which is named Saqqara. And we're going to speak about one of these absolute amazing artifacts, which is the crunching scribe. We are dating it from minus 2000 BC. So we think it's the fourth or the fifth uh, dynasty of the Egyptians. So really the first dynasty is from minus 3,800 for you to, to have an idea. So this is this artifact. It looks so human. It looks so alive that it's absolutely incredible. So it's made of limestone, copper, and painted rock crystal. 
and uh, is sitting as a tailor, as you see, on a pedestal which is painted in black, and it represents in the he's represented sorry in the act of writing, and we can see the hole between the thumb and the finger. Let's have a look at that. So that the face, and you see here, you can see there is something missing. Um, he was holding a kind of pencil uh, to to write. Uh, that has that is missing. The rest is perfectly in good. And look again at that face. Look again at this eye contact. When you turn around that statue, you know you've got a goose flash because you think, oh, it's like if that this scribe was just looking at us. After this one, we're still in Egypt because the timeline is Egypt. <laughs> and we have to be that time a little bit more north of Cairo. We see we, we go uh, by the sea and we are going to be in uh, one of the important city of that time, which is named Tanis. And so uh, it has been the capital of Egypt during the 21st and 23rd dynasty. So we're going to speak about the Great Sphinx of Tanis. So we consider it's 2800 minus 1783. Uh, so why such a large period of time? It's because that Sphinx, here it is, has got something interesting under its kind of bear, you know, like something he was wearing on the, on the chin here. Underneath, you've got what we call a cartouche. The cartouche is a little uh, place where you were naming who is the Sphinx. But in fact, for this one, it seems they use the same Sphinx for different pharaohs. It means they, when one died, he put the name, and when the next one was dying, they scratch it and they put the new name. That's why it's nearly a thousand years, because they have used the same statue for nearly thousand years. That's why I said it's from 2013 uh, to, um, sorry, 2630 to 1783. It's not because we don't know how to date it, but we think uh, it is. Uh, it has been used like that for, for a long time. And um, the Sphinx by itself, as all the Sphinx in Egypt, you know, it's a face of a human person. Here, it's a pharaoh, and it's uh, uh, set on the body of a lion. And it was a representation to protect Egypt from the invader. So he was like a dog, a guard, a dog guard at the entrance of the temples or the entrance of the cities or the entrance of the territories, you know, protecting uh, the Egypts from the invaders. But they are not going to be so well protected because the Greek are going to come. But before going to the Greek, uh, we are still going to be around the Mediterranean. In the antiquity, the world is the Mediterranean Sea, okay? It's not going to be uh, England, France, Germany, whatever. No, 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 this is the task. And we have got so all the countries from Africa, like of course, uh, Egypt, all the countries from the Middle East. And in the Middle East at that time, we have got a very important uh, city, which is named Babylon. So this is part that we call nowadays, you see that I put a little map here. We call it the Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, if I translate it in English, it means in the middle of two rivers. Meso, middle, Potami, the river. And you see there is the Euphrates and there is the tiger. So the Euphrates and the tiger are like that, parallels. And in the middle of that, we've got what we call the Mesopotamia. And at that time, um, we have got what we name the state city. Uh, I know it's not a, if I speak about Ohio or California or Ontario or Ile-de-France for me. Here we have got the city. Like if I say, I don't know, Houston, or if I say New York or things like that. So these state cities are very powerful. And one of these is very famous. It's called Babylon, the decadent city of Babylon. And in Babylon, there was a king once. And that king was named Hammurabi. And that king was ruling 1744 BC. What is interesting about this king, he was in charge of the law. So if you've got something to complain, if you've got a dispute 
to figures out, you are going to see the king. And the king was a little bit tired that every time he has to repeat the same decision. So he's going to do something, which is what you see here, which is the Hammurabi Code. This is incredible because this is considered, not by me, by the specialist, this is considered to be the first text of law. I don't know if some of you are working as a lawyer, as a judge, a prosecutor, or whatever, but at that time, the King Hammurabi is going to write all around this stone, which is look at, like a thumb. Uh, he's going to write all along that his law decisions. I could say the precedent. So like that, people don't need to see the king. They can go to the stone. They can look around the stone and find the precedent, which is going to be fine for them. There's nearly 280 precedents written in that. At the top of the statue, here it is, you see Hammurabi, uh, which is standing um, with, a, with a god of the sun, but also the god of, uh, of the law, which is named Shameh. And the king Shamash, sorry, Shamash, and the king Hammurabi is welcoming Shamash. And if now I make a zoom on part of the uh, stone, you see it's all written in that language. So uh, the Hammurabi code is 2.5 meters, so it's a bit around uh, 7.5 feet to give you an idea of the size uh, of the size of feet. And uh, so the language is Akkadian, which is one of the cuneiform writing. And you know that, check the date, 1500, 1750 BC. And one of these presidents say, and you're going to be very surprised because you know that president, because lots of you or all of you know the Bibles. And here, nearly 2000 years before the Bible, it's written here. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So that which is going to be retaken in the Bible is has been written here in the Hammurabi Code. It's absolutely fabulous to see that. So, you know, I've got many artifacts, so I can't go deeply in each artifact. I do tours about only one artifact on his um, author. So that can be, uh, if you want to go down to the artifact, we have to take uh, something just about one subject. <laughs> here, I just give you an overview of what you can see in the Louvre. Okay, that's why I go quite quickly. Now we are in, now there's Iraq, Iraq at the border of Iran and the, the, the northeast of uh, Syria. And uh, we are in the city named Korsabad. And here we find the winged bell of Korsabad. We are 700 BC, more or less. And this is this amazing statue. This statue of, uh, our, it's a bull. It's a winged bull and has got the head of the King Sargon II, which was the ruler in that city. And uh, the bull is represented because it's a strong animal. So it was a very important uh, for that. Uh, it's interesting to see on that statue, the, the effect. You know, here we see from the side and we can count easily four legs. But if I go to the front of the statue, like it is now, I need two other, two other legs because a part of that doesn't work. So the statue, if you look carefully on uh, the bull on the left, you will count not four, but five legs. It was the way they gave a visual effect that if you were arriving by side or by front, that you were always seeing the correct numbers of legs. But in fact, there is five legs. And what you see here were the entrance of the palace of Korsabad, and the French archeologists brought back the statue to France and the, the, the location of Korsabad, 700 BC, but has been discovered 1852 by the Turkish. We come close to the, to the modern era, to the, to, to the Christ era. So now we go to the other side of the Mediterranean and we arrive to Greece. And our first island is going to be when you see the little, little red spot uh, over there, um, which is going to be, uh, well, little red spot triangle, I should say, um, which is going to be uh, what we call Samotras. Samotras is an island in the north of uh, the Greek island by, uh, by Athens. And here we find a huge statue that we name the victory of Samotrasi, and it's a winged victory like the bull we saw before. We are dating it to 185 BC. So you see more or less uh, 
uh, before the more or less 200 years before the Christ. And this is the winged victory. So it's an incredible statue. She's standing at the front of a boat and she has got two wings. We didn't find the heads and we didn't find the arms. But you see, um, if you look at the uh, at the statue, you can see she's she's at sea um, because it's integrated uh, in, in integrated details. You know, uh, you can see the, the clothing. You know, is blowing in the wind as she stands uh, at atop the prow of the ship. So it's like it, it's wet. You can even see the belly button, but the belly button is covered by a toga. So in fact. Uh, the statue is not is not naked. The statue is covered with a toga, but it's so well detailed that you can even see everything on the statue. Maybe you know the name of that goddess because we know not lots of name of goddess, you know. Uh, but I'm not sure you know this one, but I'm sure you know it. It's a bit stupid what I said. No, it's what I mean is you, I tell you the god of victory, so she's not Venus, or she's not uh, whatever. No, she's a very famous American brand. I name it Nike, okay? So Nike in Greece is the, the goddess of the victory. And uh, when Nike, the American brand, started its business, they used, and they asked a lady to make a logo, and she used the winged victory, you see, as a logo, the swish that you see from Nike. Usually you see the swish the other side, but uh, that's the idea of the logo. So when you wear it next time something from Nike, think, you are wearing a Greek goddess of the victory. So our second important lady in the Louvre, you see, we saw already the most, one of the beautiful one, the victory. The next one is a pure absolute star of the Louvre with Mona Lisa, but from the antiquity, she the star. She's coming from the island of Melos, where you see the red um, arrow on my, uh, on my map. She's named the Venus of Milo. So the Greek name is Melos, and in English and French, we call it Milo. She's 100 BC, so she's really near the time of, uh, of the gods. And of course, that statue is absolutely fabulous. And it has been a big star. Why? In fact, it's for, I should say, political reason, and it has been a little bit used as a propaganda. After the defeat of Napoleon I and with the Treaty of Vienna, France has to give back 5,000 5, artifacts that Napoleon borrowed <laughs> when he was going to different countries in Europe with his army, which were located in the Louvre. So we have to give back to all the country these artifacts. And the Louvre was nearly empty. And so from the most important museum in the world, it was becoming just a normal museum and terrible for us, the French. It was underneath the British Museum, which is absolutely not possible for a French to be after a Brit, after an English, I mean. So we have to do something. And there is a sales seller who found that statue and, you know, I should say one of the very first Greek statue founded because most of the statue we were finding at that time were Roman copy. In fact, the Romans are going to use the Greek statue and they are going to make copy of it and they are going to change the name of the god. So this is named Venus of Milo, but it's a Greek statue. So she should be named Aphrodite of Milo because Aphrodite is the name for the goddess of the beauty and the love in uh, Greece and Venus, it is the name. So all these statues have got something very interesting. I show you a statue of uh, another god, and you see all these statues are always proportioned the same way. We don't know who did it because the, the, the sculpture didn't sign, but they were all following the same uh, proportion system. It means they measure the head of the statue and they put six other heads for the rest of the body and two heads from the side. So here you've got the perfect proportion of the body. So it doesn't matter if you are tall or small, it just question, are you well proportioned or not? Some statues were very small, you know, some were just big like that, and some were uh, seven meters high. So due to that, 
they had so seven meters mean uh, 20, 20 feet. So it means they have to make a proportion not to make the statue ridiculous. The only thing which were not proportion, sorry to say about that, it's about the manhood of the man. Okay, uh, that were never proportion because they wanted to keep the statue uh, humble, and so they don't want to have, you know, if you've got a seven meter statue, they don't want to have a manhood which were proportion to that. That's why they were always shrink uh, to be able to stay uh, visually correct, if I can say. So Milo is one of the big stars on one of the most loved statue in the Louvre, on the most visited statue in the Louvre. And of course, the face shows such a perfect beauty. Don't forget, this statue in the Greek time have earrings, tiara, bracelet, necklace, all this jewelry hasn't been found, but they were decorated, they were not like that. And of course, the arms are missing. It gives also a touch of the moving part of the statue. So we finish with the antiquity. We skip the Middle Age. Not interesting in art. <laughs> I'm going to be healed by the people who love the Middle Age art. <laughs> but I'm saying not so much big things in, in the Middle Age. Uh, of course, we've got uh, the set of tapestry um, um, named the, the, the Lady and the Unicorn, which is in Cluny Museum, which is a fabulous artwork. But a part of that, not too much. So let's go to the Renaissance, where we're going to find again everything. And the Renaissance, they are going to go against the Middle Age. At the Middle Age, they say antiquity, boom, we don't like it. We don't want it. Bye-bye, bye-bye, antiquity, new thing. Renaissance, they put the human being in the middle of the art. We call it humanism. And with that, they are going to recognize that the antiquity was nice. So they are going to do something mixed between antiquity and Renaissance time. So let's start with our first statue of the Renaissance. Oh, it's not a statue properly speaking, of course, because um, I'm going to speak about, um, about um, well, it's a statue, but let me explain. So we are in Italy, we're in Rome, and we discover a Roman statue, which is named Sleeping. Originally, the statue is from 150 BC, so the same time of Milo, but it's a Roman copy, and the mattress that you see here is dating from 1619. So it means the man who found the statue asked an Italian uh, sculptor at that time, a very famous one named Bernini, to do the pillow on the mattress. So the statue has been redone, if I can say, uh, not the body, but the rest of it has been redone at the Renaissance time. So that's why you've got a slight difference in technique in between the statue and the mattress. But that statue, it's very interesting, you know, because when I visit the Louvre with uh, customers, with guests inside the museum, all of them stop by the back of the statue and say, oh, ah, what a beautiful body. Mm, so well done. So beautiful. Very well proportioned. Oh, so beautiful. But when you turn around the statue, you know, you have got a little bit shock because it's an hermaphrodite. So she has got women and male and men. Uh, Autonomia. She's mixed, okay, and uh, she uh, she was uh, the the son of the daughter. Difficult to say about Hermes and Aphrodite. So Aphrodite and Hermes have a kid. That kid is going to be the hermaphrodite. Well, in fact, the story is. I mean, it's a very beautiful, handsome young guy. That's what we think, and. He meets another goddess, and the other goddess is going to hug him and ask the god of the god Zeus, please, I never want to be lived by him. I want to stay all my life with him. Zeus said, fine, and they make the two body one body. That's why hermaphrodite is like that. It's because it's a female body and a man body which has been attached together creating hermaphrodite. Well, that's the mythology way of thinking. Of course, we know nowadays uh, it's just a physical things, and we still have got lots of people which are hermaphrodites in the world. So now we're still in Italy, you know, speaking about the Renaissance and not speaking about Italy, it's a little bit difficult. Of course, I could speak about Gutenberg in Germany. I could speak about the royal castle in France, but about art in the Louvre, we have to speak about Italy. So now we go to Florence. And if we go to Florence, we are going to see uh, Venus on the street grass presenting gift to a young woman. And that we are 
around 1483, 1486 AD, and this is a Botticelli. Uh, it's a fresco, so directly painted on the wall. There is no, uh, no canvas, no wood, directly on the stone, a fresco. And uh, you, see, uh, you see Venus, uh, which is the one which is leading the group of the four ladies. And they are coming to see uh, the young ladies on the right side with the brown dress. And the three other ladies are the three grass representation of the beauty. And you see at the bottom, there is a little cupid. And so the little cupid has thrown an arrow to, uh, to the young woman. So like that, she felt in love and she's ready to be married. But if you look at her face, I think she looks a little bit grumpy. She doesn't look so happy to be married. Well, that's my personal interpretation of the, of the art, okay? Don't take it for granted. I just mean she looks a little bit, a bit vague like that. Mm, mm, you know, doesn't she say, ah, I'm so happy I'm going to be married. Well, anyway, uh, we don't know exactly the proper history. We think uh, that was the daughter of the man who uh, was owning the villa. Uh, where um, Botticelli painted the painting. So after Botticelli, we go to wow, the absolute masterpiece of the Louvre that everybody comes to the Louvre and they say, if you want to see one thing, it's not Milo, it's not Samotracy, it's another painting which has been done starting in Florence and never totally finished and finished in Amboise, in Cloulusse, where Leonardo da Vinci finished his life. He was welcomed by the crown of France. So of course we speak about Mona Lisa. And we are 1503 AD. Here she comes. That's the absolute star. So you line at least half an hour to be able to be in front of the statue. So you line half an hour outside of the loop. Then you get lost in the loop because it's very difficult to find it. So you spend another half hour to stroll and to navigate. Finally, you arrive to the room and you see there is a long line, which is another half an hour. So after one hour 30, you arrive in front of her at least, wow. And you look at it, you say, oh, it's so small. <laughs> but in fact, it's not small. You know, that painting is 80 centimeters. And at that time, that was a challenge to make a full body painting. So the lady here, I just introduce yourself to not Mona Lisa. Sorry, my friends. Um, when you see Mona Lisa uh, with the English way of saying, you don't say correctly. She's not named Mona Lisa, you know? It's like if her uh, and my friends on uh, that I saw or Bonnie or the other person I know, if I call her Miss Bonnie, <laughs> okay? Bonnie and Clyde, no, Miss Bonnie. It's not like that. So her first name is Lisa, but Mona is like Miss or Mrs. In fact, her name is Gerardini, that she married, and she married a very rich Florentine merchant who was named Della Giocondo. So in fact, her name is La Gioconde or Della Giocondo. It depends if you say it in Italian, Spanish, or French, but the Latin word, we use the surname La Gioconde and not the first name, first name Lisa. So if I want to say her correct name, I should say Lisa Gerardini del Giocondo. So I'm not going to speak very long about Mona Lisa because, you know, I do a tour about her and it's take one hour. So <laughs> I just tell you it's the absolute uh, perfection in art. And for the first time ever, that painting is going to look alive. And if you turn around the painting, the eyes are always following you. Even now, you see, it's due to a technique called sfumato that has been created, invented by Leonardo da Vinci. It's absolutely amazing. There's so many things to say about Mona Lisa that I can't see it right now. I just say, of course, when you come to the Louvre, go to see Mona Lisa, feel it, you know, appreciate it, and just don't rush, take a pictures, make a selfie, and leave. Just try to stay a little bit to, to appreciate it. Come in the, in the late evening session, session of the Louvre. It's much more uncrowded. So from Mona Lisa, we go to another important uh, Italian. Uh, he made painting, but he also makes sculpting. And so I speak about Michelangelo, who did in the Louvre, we have got two slaves of Michelangelo, the dying slave and the rebel slave he's, that has been done in Rome. 
So approximately 1513, 15, 15 AD. So this is the two slave. So the dying slave, you know, he's, uh, he has been, uh, is a martyr. Uh, so he's completely uh, attached to the stick of food and uh, he's dying. The rebel one is because we see he's fighting with the rope which, which, are, um, which are jailing him and try to break the ropes to, to release himself. That's why we said the rebel slave. All of them have got a monkey. Uh, and so there is a lot of interpretation of what that monkey is. And also it's a style that of Michelangelo we call the infinito. The infinito, it's when the statue, by the decision of the uh, sculpture, is not totally finished. It's not because it, didn't have, it was running out of time. It's a decision to make it not totally finished. Also, the, the way that the, 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 the slave is turning, it's called uh, um, contraposto, uh, which is the same position uh, that the Venus of Milo, if you remember, is the same position, uh, the contraposto. The, the just one leg is a little bit fold, and the other leg is stretched and holding the rest of the statue. So now, after that, we go, we still, we still in Italy, and we go to Venice. And in Venice was living a painter called Veronese. He was coming from Ver Ver Veron, but he went to, 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 to Venice to paint the marriage of Cana, 1563 AD. So we are getting uh, more and more close from our era. And this is the fabulous painting of, this is the largest painting that we've got in the Louvre. It's a huge painting and Mona, it's facing Mona Lisa. So you can imagine, uh, in the same room, on one side, you've got Mona Lisa. On the other side, you've got that painting. So Mona Lisa already looks small. So with that painting, she even looks smaller, even though she's smiling at you. So this is a marriage of Cana. And uh, the painter of Veronese is inside the painting. I just tried to figure who he, where he is. I will show you in couples of seconds. And this is the day that Jesus is going to change the water in wine. Because during the marriage, they were running out of water. And myself, I'm running out of tea. Feel better for my throat. Sorry for that. So they were running out of wine. So Jesus, Jesus said to a young uh, man, go to, the, go to the kitchen and bring back the water pot and serve the people. But the man said, they want wine. Do what I said. He did it. And when he arrived to the room, he served. You can see the man on the left side underneath with a yellow uh, dress. He's pouring wine. It means the water has been changed in wine. And the bride and the married person are the opposite side. On the left side, completely down. They are not very happy because, you know, there were no more wine. And where is Veronese? Right here. He's representing himself with Titian and uh, other famous uh, painters from the Renaissance into the group of the orchestra of the musician. And Veronese is the one with a silver white uh, dress with the yellow uh, socks, who is playing a kind of a special cello. So that's Veronese who painted himself inside. So we're still advancing a little bit in time and we go back to Rome. <laughs> and that time we're going to see Psyche revived by Cupid's kiss. So we are in 1787, 1793. And this is for me an absolutely divine sculpting. You know, if we think about something for Valentine days, well, just think about that love story. It's absolutely fabulous. Long story, make short. Psyche has been, was in love with Cupid. The mother, Venus, was not very happy. She said to Psyche, I give you a little bottle which is full of the beauty forever. And uh, so, but don't open it. But you know, Psyche saying to a lady, you can have a bottle to get the uh, beauty forever. You are a little bit curious <laughs> to, to find it. So finally, she smelled it. And in fact, it wasn't at all for the absolute beauty. It was just a kind of poison which was going to make her asleep, you know, a bit like uh, white snow. So she fell asleep. Uh, finally, finally, Cupid, who was uh, in love with her, knew about the story. She came, he came to her 
and he gave her a kiss, a kiss of true love. And because of this kiss of true love, Psyche came back to life. It's a bit like Snow White, no? But it's not a Disney, it's Canova. And if you look at the back of the statue, it's interesting to turn around the statue. Here you see, this is the little uh, bottle that Psyche had with her and that she opened to smell it. So you see, there's a lot of details on the statue that sometimes you just go in the front, you take a picture and you leave. But if you look much better, I could explain you more things about this statue. I just make it quick nowadays. And to finish this tour, I'm just trying to check my timing. To finish this tour, we are going to speak about the French painter. Yay! A bit of French. <laughs> so we are in the 19th century, so 1800 to the end of the 1800. And we're going to have got two periods in that, and we have got the what we we can call the uh, uh, the uh, manierism and also the romanticism, uh, the ne neo manierism and uh, the uh, romanticism. So let's start by one of the so important painting, which is the most largest painting in the, in the Louvre. So we are in the Musée du Louvre because, in fact, it has painted in the Musée du Louvre. <laughs> it didn't make a long way, you know. Painting the museum, put in the museum. Uh, so it has been ordered by Napoleon the First, and this is the coronation of Napoleon the First. And that painting is from Jacques Louis David. And that we are 1805, 1807. The painting took two years for David to do it, and this is the painting of the coronation. So what is very interesting about that painting is a propaganda uh, asked by Napoleon. You see Napoleon in the center right in the center of the of the painting so he attracts all the light you can see the rest is a little bit darker but napoleon is very bright so like that your eyes are attracted by that also he showed that he's a go-between in between the right wing so the right side of the painting where you've got the conservative the monarchy and the people from the clergy which were during the revolution the baddies and you have got the goodies the other side the left wing uh, the liberals, uh, who wants to create a new society. And so this is the working class, this is the farming class, this is the new uh, people, and also the family of Napoleon. And in between, in the middle, behind Napoleon, the man in black, that the army. Don't forget, Napoleon was a soldier. So by that, Napoleon show he's a go-between, between the right and the left. He's the one who can reunify France. And you can see just behind Napoleon, there is a man sitting, if you look carefully on it, you will see he's a little bit grumpy face. This is the Pope, because Napoleon decided when the Pope wanted to stand up to crown him, but Napoleon said, thank you, I don't need that, I can crown myself. And Napoleon crowned himself and crowned his wife. And uh, of course, uh, that's uh, very, very important by that, because he showed by that, that he respects God, but he's the boss, he's over the Pope. He doesn't need the Pope to do that. And the Pope is the representative of God on earth for the Roman Catholic. So Napoleon said, in fact, it's me. So lots of things to say about that painting. Uh, also, I do a tour about this one. So I just give you some of the important details about the painting. Second painting, which is absolutely amazing in the Louvre. So we are, we are in 1805. We go a little bit more further. We, are, we go to the north of Paris by Montmartre in the street Rue des Martyrs, that's where Jericho had got his workshop, and that's where he painted this painting, which is named The Raft of the Medusa, which has been done 1818, 1819. It's a terrible story. It's a totally true story. And Jericho did, uh, you know, a kind of investigation work. So the boat was existing. It's called La Meduse in French, the Medusa in English, and that boat sunk. And the people on the boat had to make a raft because the commander of the boat and the officer left with a rescue boat. You can imagine how bad they were. They have been condemned for that uh, later on. But 150 people are going to stand on a raft without capacity of sailing, hoping that a rescue boat is coming from them. We did. Um, in, so this is the painting. And we did a reconstruction of that, I will show you. So you can see on that painting that uh, Jericho is showing two parts. There is one triangle on the left side, which is the death. You see all the people here are dead. And on the other side, there is another pyramid, the pyramid of the hope. It's been 
that's where they are going to see the rescue boat. But they are going to stay more than two weeks at sea. And they don't have anything else apart of rum to drink. No water, only rum. So they were many all drunk. Of course, a lot of them died and no food. So they had to do cannibalism. This is a true story. Only 10 survived. And Jericho interviewed seven of them and he put them into the painting. So it's a very, very realistic painting. And I just show you, you see, we rebuilt the raft, not the real size of the raft. And we put the numbers of people in the raft, which were exactly the numbers of people that was that day. You can see how the raft is bad. The water was coming inside. They don't have, they just have a kind of little cell, but that's nothing to navigate. And you can imagine the horror that has to be with the cannibalism. Last painting, so the end of the tour. We are now by the in the in the uh, in the part of Paris that we name um, the, the, the the left bank, and we go to the Museum of Eugène de la Croix, which was also his workshop. And he painted here, and I like to finish by that because you know, being French, we love being the world champion of the strike, demonstration, and revolution. So this is the Liberty guiding the people, a famous painting from de la Croix made in 1830 AD. And this is the painting. And you see on that painting, uh, the woman in the center is the Liberty. She doesn't care about her outfit. You see, she's topless. She has got the Republican flag, meaning this is the democracy, not the monarchy. This is the revolution of 1830 when uh, the population of Paris raised against the King Charles X and they defeated him and in three days, the three glorious day of July, the King is going to be replaced by another King which is going to be a more, much more liberal Louis Philippe. So this lady, she's representing the liberty of democracy. In France, the representation of the Republic and democracy is always a woman. We think the ladies are a bit wiser than the men. Sorry, guys, but we think they are a little bit less uh, aggressive. So we think democracy has to be represented by a lady. She's guiding the people. Come with me. And you can see on the painting, there is a little boy, meaning it's not only the old which are going to do the job, but also the kids. And if you look on the left side, you see here, there is two men which are fighting together for the liberty. One has got a top hat, a tie, a short gun. He's a rich person, he's a bourgeois. The other one behind has got an open shirt, a cap, um, a sword. He's a uh, working class, meaning that revolution is not like the one before, the left versus the wing, you know, uh, the first, <laughs> sorry, the left versus uh, the right. But this is all the French, different generation, doesn't matter rich or poor, together fighting for the liberty against the king. What time is it? Woo! One hour. I did it. <laughs> so my friends, <laughs> I finished the presentation. It's a kind of challenge, you know, to try to show you in one hour uh, all these things. It's just, it's just, uh, if I can say a teasing, an introduction, okay? Uh, because each of these painting needs at least, or sculpting need at least one hour to explain everything, every details, uh, every allegory. Uh, but in one hour, I, I, I felt too bad just to choose Milo or to and say that. No, I wanted to give you the, the whole vision of what you have to do if you come to Paris and to visit the Louvre. You can do that in three hours, okay? Uh, speed, but three hours. And if you want to take more time, okay, let's take the whole day because your tickets are valid from nine. If you come the Friday from nine to nine, so it's uh, 12 hours, uh, you can go out and come back. And that's absolutely a fabulous day if you, if you do that in the Louvre and you can really go deeply in each thing. But now it was a kind of large introduction. So I hope that has been interesting, interesting you. I hope you could understand my English. I have a little bit of straw egg. That's why also my voice is a little bit low. And uh, now I'm happy to, to be able to reply to the question. So I'm going to open the, the chat section that, have, uh, that I closed uh, during the tour. So Patrick, a wonderful job. Uh, folks, let's give Patrick a big virtual round of applause. Uh, Patrick, let's take about 10 minutes of questions and comments. 
Uh, Patrick, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read them to you to try to expedite things. And just so you know, Patrick, only you and I can see the chat and the Q&A. Uh, the, the attendees cannot uh, read what's written. Um, so uh, Janice says, so great to experience the Louvre with you. With you. Diane says, thank you for sharing this with us. I love the histories. Mary says, great job. Lucy says, fantastic. Lisa says, you are amazing. And this was so much fun. Uh, Stephen says, just to complete the connection, the Statue of Liberty was given in 1886 and based on the Lady Liberty from France. I'm sure you knew that, Patrick, right? I am. I just yeah. can say one word, if you can make a break. Uh, this is not the Statue of Liberty that I've shown you. This is the liberty guiding the world. The Statue of Liberty has been done by Bartholdi, uh, given to America, uh, and uh, the statue inside, uh, the, the metal structure has been done by Gustave Eiffel, the one who did the Eiffel Tower. And America, to say thank you to France, give us another one made by Bartholdi, which is standing in Pont de Beaugrenel in Paris, facing the one in New York, so the two statues are facing each other, eyes to eyes, to show the connection of friendship between France and America. So the one we saw is not the Statue of Liberty. So because the Statue of Liberty is the flame of the liberty, that one has a flag, the flag of the democracy. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that clarification. Uh, Elaine says, I thank you so much for an informative presentation about art, history, and the Louvre. Uh, Eileen says, thank you. This was so interesting. Barbara says it was fabulous. Uh, Stephen says Patrick is a very giving, informed, and beautiful person. Um, Rika says so interesting. Sculptures and paintings are just gorgeous. Thank you for thank you, thank you, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Catherine would uh, love for you to come back and give your hour presentation on Mona Lisa. Uh, we'll see. Well, I'll see what I can do, Catherine. Uh, Lynette says this was wonderful. Judy says it was great. Diane says, when I visited the Louvre several years ago, there were so many people around the Mona Lisa that I couldn't get close enough to look at it. People were completely ignoring uh, da Vinci's other paintings nearby, like the Virgin of the Rocks. Uh, any comments there, uh, Patrick? Is it hard to get a good look at the Mona Lisa due to the crowds? Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's very, very difficult. And um, unfortunately, you know, it's so crowded uh, that if you don't arrive in the first in the morning and if you don't run to Mona Lisa by 9 a.m. or if you don't be in the Louvre uh, by the closing day, the, the, the night session of the Louvre by, by 9 p.m., you always have to, to, to wait um, at least half an hour to go there. But when you are in front of it, you can take your time. And so the one behind you are frustrated because they can't, <laughs> you are waiting, <laughs> but you can uh, take the time for Mona Lisa. I have got the, had got the great privilege that after the, the COVID, uh, when we reopened the Louvre, I was there the first day of the grand reopening of the Louvre and we were five people inside the Louvre, a part of the guard, because everybody was a little bit worried. So I was there with my, with my mask, but we were only five in Mona Lisa room. So, you know, I could stay like that and look at Mona for for hours without being disturbed. That was absolutely amazing. I guess that's a, that's a silver lining, yeah. Uh, Teresa says, fabulous presentation. I felt like I stepped into the Louvre. Thank you for bringing such amazing, amazing selections of art into our homes. Uh, Marie says this was very informative. Joanne loved it. Deborah says it was wonderful. Susan says, excellent tour. And Susan asks, is there a book you would recommend on the history of the building of the Louvre? So if, if someone wanted to learn more, Patrick, is there a book or another source you would recommend? Well, um, I don't have a, a, the, the, the name of the book. You know, I, we have got a fabulous bookshop in the Louvre. When you leave the Louvre, you pass by the bookshop. So the ground floor is only about reproduction, uh, some goodies. But if you go to the first floor, you have got the bookshop of the Louvre. And inside that, you've got uh, all, all the books. So it depends how deep uh, you want to go in the subject. There's some books which are more, um, if I can say, easy uh, to, to, to read with a lot of image. And, and some are very uh, a little bit more, I, I won't say boring. I just mean much more uh, going deeply in the history. So it depends how you want to be. So 
I, I can I can send you some I can send to you Robert if you want after some name of books and if you want to to send to the person like like right now like that I don't have one title in yeah. in a... yeah that's fine no no worries uh, Anne says it was fantastic. Uh, Nancy says, great presentation. Uh, you make the art so understandable and interesting. Pamela says, your talk was excellent and she loves your beautiful accent. Uh, Dory says, great presentation. Mary has a question. She asks, is there one day of the week that is better to visit? So there is one day of the week that you better not go. It's a Tuesday because it's closed. Okay, uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> okay. Then the best day for me is a Friday, a Friday night session. Uh, then of course uh, the weekend is absolutely uh, terrible because there's so many people inside. And avoid also the first uh, Sunday of the month because it's free for everybody. So many people go there. A part of that midweek Wednesday. Uh, it's a, a little bit less crowded because people, when they come to Paris, if they come for four days, usually they come around Thursday to Tuesday, some day, Thursday to Monday. You know, so I mean, uh, the Wednesday maybe it's a little bit uh, less crowded. But my my preference is to visit the Louvre by the night session. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Uh, so, folks, we started a few minutes late. We're going to take five more minutes of questions and comments. Five more minutes. Uh, Richard says this was a very clear presentation. Nancy says, you made me cry at the beauty of some of the statues that you showed. Uh, this was an amazing tour. Thank you so much. Uh, Armin says that uh, the time flew by. It was so interesting. Uh, Nancy wants to know, do you have a personal favorite piece of art in the Louvre? So of all the things you've showed us and maybe some of the things you haven't, do you have a favorite, Patrick? Well, I really do love uh, the the face of the uh, Ain Ghazal statue, the oldest one, um, because when I look at that face and I see these eyes which are looking at me, I I can't, can't imagine they are nine thousand years old, and uh, always it it, uh, it gives me a little bit uh, goose uh, goose uh, uh, I forgot how you say goose flash or you know, something on the uh, you know it's uh, I love that. Then there's some piece of art that I haven't shown there because they are not the most uh, famous in the Louvre, uh, but that, that I like a lot. For instance, uh, the head of uh, uh, yeah, some of the Renaissance painting um, that I like with, uh, with the Virgin Mary, uh, which are absolutely beautiful, um, but they are not the, 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 the most famous. And sometimes, not the, the, sometimes some of the artifacts which are a little bit less famous can be also uh, over, over um, I mean, really, uh, really uh, mean, mean, moving you. Uh, I don't know if I said the correct word, but give you a lot of uh, em emotion. Um, but Ein Gazal, it's something that I can't, uh, I can't help looking at the eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, Deidre says this was uh, enchanting and engaging. Eileen says very interesting. I took French years ago and loved looking at the maps with the landmarks written in French. Uh, thank you for refreshing my memory. Bernice says this was a fantastic tour. Thank you so much, Patrick, for your amazing knowledge. The one and only time I visited the Louvre was back in 1970. Uh, Kay says this was a great topic. Uh, N says this was a wonderful tour. Um, one of my friends uh, and suggests you drink some ginger tea. Uh, Irina says, thank you very much, very interesting. And this talk adds a lot to our visit to the Louvre. Mary says it would be wonderful to have another uh, presentation on the impressionists of the Dorsey. Uh, I'll see what I can do, Mary. Uh, Jean, is, Jean is trying to embarrass me by putting her comments in French. Um, I'm gonna do my best here. Uh, she says, thank you very much for this uh, magnificent presentation. It was um, educational. I appreciated uh, your humor. Uh, I have uh, visited Paris uh, several times uh, and I miss it. And you are lucky to live there, is what Jean says. Uh, Terry says, is there any more movement to uh, repatriate any of the works from the, the antiquity, antiquity period back to the Middle East? So let me repeat that. 
Is there any more movement to repatriate any works from the antiquity period back to the Middle East? That's, that's a very interesting question and a very uh, difficult question. Uh, the fact is, I told you we have got 35,000 pieces of artifact, but I haven't told you that we have got 150,000 pieces of artifact in uh, the basement of the Louvre, which is not shown to the public. That's why we also open a Louvre in Dubai and we open a Louvre in Lens, the north of France. We open subsidiaries of the Louvre to be able to present more product, uh, more artifact. Then the question of sending back. I'm, I'm, I would love that we could send back some of the artifacts, especially maybe not for the year, uh, you know, maybe not for the um, Egyptian or for the Greek. They already have so so much in their own countries, but not, but for the African, for the Black African, where it was the French colony, and we stole all the art from this French colony and we brought them back in France. And now, ninety percent of them are just waiting, staying in the basement of our museum. But there is a problem, a, a technical uh, problem. These, all these pieces of art have been registered as a national property. So it means myself, I'm owning uh, 160 million of these pieces of art, okay? Because we are 60 million people, French people. And so every French citizen, it's a part, it's my part. So if we wanted to give that, we have to get like, like the 60 million French people have to say, okay, we do agree for that. Okay, we can't have just a, 50% of them say yes and 50% say no, because uh, it's a French property. It has been registered like that by Napoleon. So it's very difficult uh, to give back uh, because if we give back, if there is somebody in France who, make, who put the government in a case, he's going to lose because of the law. And I'm very sorry for that because I think we, we should give at least all the things that we don't show. Uh, Lisa says, thank you for covering the code of, um, uh, ha uh, I always struggle with this one, ham ham uh, ham Hammerby, that's probably not right. And that's what uh, I yes, thank you. So that's the, that's the, she said that's the main thing I went to the Louvre for. Uh, Jean, uh, we're gonna skip your question, but perhaps we'll cover it in a future presentation. Marilyn recommends buying your tickets in advance so you don't have to waste your time uh, standing in line. Uh, absolutely. Carol said, yep. Absolutely. That's, that's absolutely necessary these days. You know, we never have so many people in the Louvre. The Louvre has got the record of visitors for a museum in the world. That's why we're number one um, with 10 million visitors. Uh, but this year we are going to overtake, we're going to, to break that record. Uh, myself, I'm in the Louvre doing two or three, three days per week. And it's so crowded, and we were already in May, in April, it was full book. So, and I've seen two weeks ago, there was four hours outside waiting for the ticket line. And after you get your ticket, you again have to make the line to go inside. So you can lose half day. So buy in advance. The Louvre is not a big price. You know, the Louvre is quite affordable. It's 17 euro to go mm -hmm. inside, and it's free if you are minus 26. So, uh, so really, it's something to do. You buy a ticket in advance and you are so comfortable. Uh, Carol and Emily say thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, we like being able to access these online events. Uh, they uh, live in Essex, uh, United Kingdom. So thanks for joining us, Carol and Emily. Uh, Amy says thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Catherine says your presentation was so informative and interesting. She wants to book a trip to the Louvre right now. Uh, Mary, I put a link to the uh, Louvre uh, bookstore uh, in the chat uh, that should be accessible to everyone. Uh, Kent asks, and I, I don't know if you explained this at the beginning, uh, I don't think you did. Um, what does the Louvre actually mean? What does the word mean? Um, we are not 100% sure about that. Okay. Uh, some people think it's come from the, uh, from the Viking time when they were attacking Paris, and it's a same, it, the word etymologically coming from wolf, Louvre, 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 okay? So some people say it that. Some of the people say, no, it's the first king of France, Clovis, in 500, when he attacked the Romans to deliver uh, the city, to reconquest the city by the, by the French, and that he put a kind of uh, military structure, the other side, and that was named the Louvre. So, we don't have a hundred percent certitude about it. You can read certain response, 
but somebody else is going to give you another response. Uh, Ron says, wonderful presentation. Elizabeth says, excellent presentation. Uh, let me jump back to the chat. We'll wrap up the chat here. Um, uh, Tirza says, this was amazing. Um, and I apologize for mispronunciations here. Um, uh, at, at Suko says, a couple of years ago, I joined Patrick's presentation on the raft of the Medusa. He covered a lot of the historical background of the painting, which was very interesting. I would love to learn it again from Patrick if, if Tewksbury invites him back. All right, well, stay tuned, okay? Uh, why don't we uh, take a moment here? Why don't you plug your uh, your business? Uh, I, I give you permission, because uh, Nancy's asking, uh, can we request a tour from you? Joseph wants to know, is it possible to get into one of your tour guides? So how would someone go about uh, learning more about your tours, uh, Patrick? So I put my I put my email address. If somebody wants to get more, so they can they can uh, they can send me a message. They will be much more more than so that the email address I put in the in the in the chat. Then I have got a website. Everything is Le Paris de Patrick. Okay. Yeah, so, so folks, I will include um, Patrick's uh, email and website in the follow-up email that I send to all of you uh, later today. Actually, realistically, it'll probably be tomorrow if I'm being honest, <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll make sure to do that. Yeah, um, I've got uh, the YouTube channel. Uh, on the YouTube, I've got recorded some of my street tour because I've been doing for more than two years um, live streaming uh, in Paris, but not only in Paris. And that's not a webinar like that. So we are in, I was in the street and I was showing different parts of Paris. And these days I'm putting on my YouTube channel because today it's an important day, no? Uh, it's the 6th of June. So I say thank you for the tribute of all the uh, young men and women who came to France for the 6th of June, because this is the D-Day uh, of, uh, of, the, of the Second World War. Uh, so today it's a very important uh, day. Uh, for that, and I have been doing uh, many tours about the D-Days to give a tribute to the uh, American troops, but also um, English troops, Canadian troops, all of them who come all over uh, the sea to come here and died on the beaches of Normandy uh, to bring back the liberty uh, in Europe. Uh, so in that, in these days, if you go to my YouTube channel, Le Paris, Paris de Patrick, you will see all the tour. It's free, of course. You will see all the tour that uh, you, you can see. Then if you want to take a tour with me, uh, I'm still doing a live streaming and I'm, of course, man, most of my time I am in, uh, in the streets with my guests in Paris to make, uh, to make tours and visiting. Uh, I'm a licensed, professional licensed guide in France, so I've got, I'm from the Ministry of Culture. So, of course, uh, I'm, I've got the habilitation to go to any um, museum or any place in France. Mm -hmm. So folks, uh, one thing I want to point out is I actually learned about Patrick from a patron. So the patron filled out the feedback survey. Uh, and the very last question is, do you have any recommendations for future programs and speakers? And someone mentioned Patrick. And now fast forward three, four months later, here we are. So just so you know, I take those feedback surveys very seriously. And so please fill them out. And if you do know of any wonderful speakers that you would recommend, uh, please mention that to me at the bottom of each feedback survey. Uh, so Patrick, I'm, I'm so pleased that we met. And I know this is not going to be the last time you do a presentation for the Tewksbury Library. I'm sure uh, we'll do some in the future. Um, uh, I'll circle back to you, Patrick, for any last words. Uh, but uh, before we wrap up, folks, uh, just a reminder to look for an email from me tomorrow. Uh, with the recording, the feedback survey, and information about some other upcoming travel programs and art history programs. We typically do travel programs on Tuesday mornings and art history program on Thursday mornings. So keep an eye out for that email tomorrow. Um, Patrick, do you have any last words for the audience before we let you go? Merci. Yeah. Mercy, Merci. right back at you, Patrick. Thank you to have been there, and uh, I wish you were a great time. So now in Paris, it's uh, the evening, even it's a beautiful sunny day. So the sky is all blue. I look by my windows, uh, but I wish you to all of you are a fabulous day and um, the best for your life. Merci beaucoup. Yeah. Merci beaucoup, Patrick. Thank you so much and have a great uh, rest of your night. Thank you. Yep. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.